Welcome to Speed 2 The Poseidon Adventure. Now this is a tale of how we tested one cruise ship over the course of one week. There were two of us on the vessel, me and a colleague. Six engines on this ship. It's quite a big one. There was a seven metre swell. Now the weather got quite rough at one point, uh, at which point I found out my colleague was actually quite seasick. Um, yeah, it was pretty rough to be honest. There were 500 Wi-Fi access points distributed across the ship. 500 CCTV cameras, 1,200 crew and over 2,000 passengers. So this is really, really quite a big place. And there were, of course, a pile of vulnerabilities, some of which I'm going to tell you about now. So what is on a brand new cruise ship? Well, it's not only a ship, obviously, but it's also a hotel. It's got to perform all those hotel functions. You've got shopping malls, so you've got shops, you've got restaurants, you've got all of these different things going on, taking payments and so on. And lots, lots more when you think about it. When we break it down a bit further, we've got the offboard communication. So we've got VSAT, Iridium and Fleet Broadband, things like that, the ship's radio. We've got um, physical security. So how do we stop people getting onto the bridge, into the machine rooms, into the engine room? We've got to keep the navigation systems up to date and secure so the ship can navigate safely. You've got all the networking equipment spread across the vessel doing both passenger and industrial control side of things. You've got the load computer and the load monitoring systems to make sure that the stability of the vessel is good. You've got all the ICS equipment. You're going to have a crew network. People can browse the internet on their laptops and phones when they're away from home for long periods of time. And it just gets complex really, really fast. The attack surface is huge. So a modern cruise ship, and this isn't the one we tested, it's just an image, um, is divided up into vertical fire zones. Now these are both fire and watertight barriers. The idea is if there's a fire or a hole in the vessel, it still stays safe. So that fire can't spread quickly and water can't get from one compartment to another. Now, why is this relevant to us? Well, it, it drives how the network is designed. So the network is divided up into fire zones. So we've got something called an RDP, a remote distribution point. It's essentially a very, very large rack of Cisco gear. Um, there'll be multiple ones of these per fire zone. Now, for each fire zone, we need to split that network out into other ones. So what we have are things called cabin switches. So we've got multiple loops of cabin switches on each RDP. So those cabin switches are connected via wired Ethernet. The RDPs are connected via fiber. So we'll have big, big loops of cabin switches, maybe 10 or 20 cabins. So each RDP will have multiple loops on it. Now, to provide a degree of redundancy, they actually have uh, port and starboard side RDPs as well. So they're all connected via a fibre network. Now, of course, as well, you're going to have servers. So you've got things like the TV, you've got the Wi-Fi access, you've got the VSAT so you can gain access to the Internet when you're on the vessel. So this is kind of what it looks like. It's divided up into these fire zones and you've got this massive loop of RDPs connected via fibre with lots of cabin sw switches connected in loops. Now this is what one of those RDPs looks like. This is half of one of them. So you can see the sheer scale here. Bear in mind, each pair of Ethernet cables coming out there, it's actually going through a loop of cabins. So when you think about the sheer scale of this, it, it really is quite huge. Now to look into one of those loops in more detail, I've broken one of those cabin switches out. Now there'll be a cabin and we've got IPTV. So you can watch the TV in your cabin and some, some of it's streamed from servers. There's live broadcasts of, um, of the shows on the ship. That will be done over IP and it's on a VLAN and it's connected into the cabin. You've got a VoIP phone as well. So that's another network connection into the cabin. But then the really interesting one to me was the cabin control system. And that controls the lighting. It controls the HVAC or the air conditioning. It controls the door, the access control, and it controls the hot water as well. Um, it's really important that you uh, heat the water up beyond a certain point periodically to prevent uh, Legionnaire's disease on ships. Now, that's quite a lot of control. The reason they have it is when a cabin's unoccupied, they can turn the lights off. They can turn the HVAC down so that they're not using as much energy. And yeah, it's, it's an important system. Now, each cabin switch actually worked on a pair of cabins, A and B. They were almost identical in almost all situations. But some cabin switches also had other networks hanging off them. So they had Wi-Fi access points, 500 Wi-Fi access points that were distributed across the vessel. Ships are made of metal, um, which means you have to have a lot of access points to have good coverage. But we also had all of the CCTV cameras. What that means is that that trunk that flows through the cabin switches 
contains the TV, the VoIP, the cabin control, the Wi-Fi and the CCTV. So it's quite an important trunk network. So what is the threat model here? Well, I called this talk Speed 2. Why did I call it Speed 2? Well, I don't know if you've seen Speed 2, but in Speed 2, uh, an engineer of the shipping company on the vessel, on it, on sailing on it, takes control. He also kills the captain, but we're going to ignore that bit. He takes control of the ship and he programs it to crash into another ship. So the important thing here is the attacker was already on board. It's not always remote attack we're worried about here. When you regularly invite 2,000 people onto your ship, there's a chance that some of them might be malicious. Now, they might not be malicious enough to crash the ship into another ship, but they still might want to do bad things. So what are the risks? Well, Speed 2 highlighted control of the vessel. Now, if you've got physical access to the controls on a ship, you can nearly always take control of it. But the thing is, the crew should nearly always be able to stop that. Despite the fact that all of this fancy control systems connect everything together, you can nearly always take manual control of things. You can at least stop them. You can always take control of certain things. So control of the vessel also needs a fairly strong motivation. For an attacker to want to steer a ship into another ship, particularly one with 2,000 people on it, they, they've got to have a screw loose. So although the impact of this is huge, the likelihood is probably quite low. But the other thing that cruise companies are worried about is loss of passenger services. So if everybody's suddenly locked out of their cabin and has to visit guest services, that's 2,000 people queuing up to get new access cards. If the ship can't sail from a port or the ship can't dock at a port, they're going to have to pay money. If people can't pay for things in the shop, if they can't order in the restaurant, it costs the cruise company money. And this is what we were trying to investigate mainly on this test. What impact could we cause by impacting the passengers? I'm going to talk about a few issues here. The first one, the satisfying Wi-Fi. Now, there was guest Wi-Fi on this ship. So these access points were spread about the vessel. Now, they gave access to the corporate network. They gave access to the passenger management system that we'll talk about later. But they also had the guest Wi-Fi. Now, we could connect to that, obviously, and then we could start exploring the network. Now, one of the first things that we do when we connect to a guest network like this is we do a trace route. And we did a trace route out to Google DNS. And what we could see was the first few ping times were 25 milliseconds, give or take, which means we're on the vessel. The ones after that jump up to 700 plus milliseconds. That means we've gone over that VSAT link. VSAT satellite connections are latent. So we know those first three steps in the, the route are on the vessel. So we decided to explore them in more detail. And what we found was, in fact, that second to last hop allowed us access to equipment in the VSAT rack. So from the guest Wi-Fi, we connect, connect through to the VSAT rack. Now we've worked a lot on VSAT equipment in the past. So we know the default passwords for most of the bits of equipment. So we found that we could log into the modem. We found that we could log into the router. So we could log into the modem. Now the modem tunnels all traffic on and off the vessel. What my colleague did was spent a period of time looking at the firmware, examining how that device operated. And what he found was that he could gain root access to that device. So now we've got root access on a device that all of the offboard traffic's going in and out of. We could therefore intercept it. So we could intercept everything going on and off the vessel. So any credentials in plain text, anything unencrypted was ours to see. So this is quite a serious problem, especially as we could do it from anywhere on the guest Wi-Fi. So the problem here was the passenger Wi-Fi had access to the VSAT equipment. There were default passwords on the VSAT equipment. There was a vulnerability that allowed root access, which allowed us to intercept all offboard traffic. Now, the thing was, this could be solved at multiple stages. The network could be altered so that the passenger Wi-Fi couldn't access all of these management interfaces on those devices. The VSAT installer, a third party, could have changed the passwords on those so that we couldn't just trivially guess them. The vendor could have not had a vulnerability in their device, which could have prevented us doing this. But you'll notice I mentioned the third party there. All of the VSAT equipment is installed by a third party, not the cruise company. So that will come in, in back in a few, uh, few vulnerabilities. Issue two, just another hole in the wall. Now, one of the most important things for safety of a ship is stability. So you've got to make sure that the fluid levels in all of your tanks keep the vessel stable. So if you ride too high in the water, you could be unstable. If you ride too low in the water, the ship's inefficient. 
if you put too much stress on the hull, the ship could become unsafe. Now, ships are hugely complex now, and you can't do these calculations on paper. So you use something called a load computer. And this will take readings from all the tanks around the vessels. It will take things like the passenger manifest. It will take things like the stores telling you how much food, beer, wine is on board. And it will calculate if the vessel's stable or not and tell you what to do to make it stable. Now, it's vital for a modern ship that this is there. And we managed to compromise it in this instance, but not only compromise the load computer, we also managed to cause a denial of service to bridge systems that were important for day-to-day -day operations. Now most of these ships have something called an integrated control and monitoring system. So that's all the screens on the bridge, that's all the screens and HMIs, all the PLCs down in the engine room. So it glues all of the industrial equipment on that ship together. So that'll be the power, the generators, the propulsion, the rudder, everything is glued together by this massive system. Now it's a blend of IP and serial networks, like you'd see in most industrial control systems. Now ideally, it should be segregated. There should be an air gap between those two of them. So we've got the passenger network on one side and we've got the bridge network on the other. But quite often we find that this gets eroded by changes that are made by third parties. Now when we look into the bridge system in a bit more detail, we've got the IP devices, so the PCs driving the screens and so on, but they also need to interact with serial connected devices. So that would be things like GPS, uh, anemometers, speed loggers, all of these different bits of equipment. But it also has to interact with the ballast tank monitoring system, the fuel tank monitoring system, and the hull stress monitoring system. So you've got these things called IP to serial converters. They go from an IP network through to a serial network, RS-232, RS-485, Modbus, something like that. So you can interact with these serial devices. They look like this. So on one side, you've got Ethernet coming in. On the other side, you've got Serial. There's lots and lots of different brands. Moxa are probably one of the most popular ones. If you've done any industrial control system work, you'll recognize these. Now, you remember I mentioned the load computer. Now, that has to get those readings from the ballast tanks and the fuel tanks. So how does it do that? Well, they've got a load computer server that's buried in a machine room, and it's got its own IP to Serial converter that connects into one of the serial networks that's on the bridge that interacts with all of these different monitoring systems. Now, to actually use the load computer, there's got to be a UI, which is another computer sat up on the bridge. So you've got a problem. How do you connect the two of them together? Now, if you've ever worked on a ship, you can't just go drilling holes through the floor. You can't just make holes in walls. You've got to go through specific cable penetrations and then put fire seal around it change requests it's really really awkward so if you've got to go down three decks you probably don't want to have to run a cable now this load computer was installed by a third party and what they found was that they could plug into any wall port and connect together so that load computer server down in a machine room there's a wall port near it they plugged into it they plugged the load computer into another wall port on the bridge and they found they could connect to each other so they used it. That's a lot easier than making a hole through multiple decks. Now on this vessel, what happened was if you plugged into a wall port, if you had an 8021X certificate for the corporate network or an 8021X certificate for the PMS, you'd gain access to that network. But if you didn't, you ended up in a tar pit, a specific VLAN and a specific network that didn't have internet access, didn't have access to other networks on the ship, but it was its own network and devices could communicate with each other. So this was what the load computer company exploited. They found they could just plug in, get tar pitted and communicate. But that becomes a bit of a problem because me as an attacker, I can come along and I can plug in to a wall port in the bar. I can plug into a wall port next to the swimming pool and I gain access to that same tar pit. So now I had access to the load computer, UI and server. Now we've tested ships with this same load computer system on it before and what we found was there's a default username and password stored in an any file. Now with physical access to the machine of course you can read that username and password. A big problem on ships is that you can't lock computers on the bridge because they've got to be used and got to be used quickly. You can't be remembering a complex password typing it in to gain access to something so they stay unlocked. So we found this default username and password on a previous test. With that, 
what we could do was connect to that load computer server. We could then pivot through it to take control of the IP to serial converter. Now, you've got those ballast tank levels, the fuel tanks, the whole stress monitoring system, and I've now got the ability to inject messages onto there. Now, serial networks have got a bit of an issue here. You can just generally spoof messages. If the ballast tank's sending out a message of a given type, you can send out another message of the same type onto that serial network, and there's no way to tell that you've been spoofing that. The problem here is, of course, is the bridge systems will trust that data. So what we found is we could inject our own ballast tank levels, our own fuel tank levels, onto this system. So the problem here, the load computer system needed a network connection, and the third party found that arbitrary wall ports connected together, so they used them. That meant the load computer was accessible from any wall port. A shared password that we learned on a previous test allowed us to gain access to that load computer. We could pivot to the IP to serial converter. We could inject tank readings onto the control network. And then we could spam the bridge ICMS. We could spam all of the screens on the bridge, giving them wrong ballast tank readings. Now, what is the ICMS going to do when it's receiving two different readings? It's going to probably toggle between the two. There might be some filtering, but what happens if we spam twice as fast? What happens if we change how those, the messages are being sent? The thing here is, is when you're on the bridge, you want to concentrate on navigating. You want to concentrate on safety. If suddenly you're getting loads and loads of alarms showing up saying that a fuel tank's empty, that a ballast tank's full, that something's leaking, that would be really bad. It distracts the navigators on the bridge. So it causes a denial of service to certain services. It might be the case that when this happens, someone would have to go around and do something called manual tank dipping. So you actually dip a weight with a string into the tanks to find out how much is in them. It becomes time consuming. So something you want to avoid. Now, issue three, time and tide wait for no VLAN. Yeah, these puns are bad, sorry. Now, coming back to the idea of the cabin switch, it's got that black trunk network flowing through it that's got all of these TV, VoIP phones, Wi-Fi, all of these different VLANs that are quite interesting to us as an attacker. Now, the problem is this cabin switch was located in the passageway, the corridor between the cabins. They're quite narrow on a cruise ship. So I had to open a panel, I had to open the box it was in, I had to then physically unscrew the switch and then connect to it to mess about with it. Now, the problem with this is 500 CCTV cameras, um, people walking up and down the passageways, you're getting in the way, you're going to get noticed. So we thought, well, what can we do to make this easier? What can we do to access this from our cabin? So coming back just down to one individual cabin, what we did first off was we disconnected our TV and VoIP phone. So we just unplugged the Ethernet cables from the back of them. We then went to the, the cabinet in the wall in the passageway and we bridged directly onto the trunk with those cables. So we took our cabin switch out of the network. So it was feeding into our cabin via this structured cabling that was already installed. We then put our own switch into that loop. So now we were part of that VLAN trunk. We were connected in that big loop. What that meant was we could intercept all of the traffic flowing about that VLAN and we could connect to all of the devices on those VLANs as well. So this gave us a lot of power. We found out the TVs had default passwords. We couldn't really do much apart from stop them working though. The VoIP phones, again, default passwords, we could change their settings so they didn't work. The Wi-Fi was actually really quite secure. There wasn't much we could do to that. The CCTV, however, the uh, CCTV VMS, the video management system, connected out to all of the cameras using RTSP, which is a plain text protocol. Now, there was authentication. The cameras did require login, but we could intercept as well as connect to the cameras. So we could see the password flying about on the network which meant we could connect to all of the cameras on the ship and view all of them with, without, just from the, the comfort of our own cabins. So this was a bit of an issue. Now coming back to that cabin control system that does the lighting, the HVAC, door and water. Now most systems like this that have got hundreds of nodes will connect back to a server. So they make a connection from the device through to the server. This one was a bit weird though. It worked the other way around. The cabin control server established connections out to the cabin control in the cabins. This was, this was a bit weird, but what that meant was we didn't have to compromise the cabin control server to interact with the cabin controls. We were on the VLAN that they were all on. So we could come along with our switch and we could actually compromise all of the cabin controls. So we could turn the lights on and off. We could mess about with the aircon. We could lock people out of their cabins. We could even open doors on the, the accessibility cabins, the ones with automated doors. Quite a lot of power. 
again, you're impacting the passengers. You're costing them, you're making them uncomfortable, which means they're gonna complain, it's gonna cost you money. The other thing we thought would be amusing would be writing something on the side of the ship. Now, some, some ships have this functionality where through the cabin control system, you can actually write things on the side of the vessel. This isn't the one we tested, but it'd be great to write something on the side of a ship that big. The other problem with this cabin control system was that the switches were physically accessible to us. Now, of course, we had to be in the passageway, but there's an attack that we carry out against switches quite a lot of the time. Now, it does require physical access. Most Cisco switches have something called password recovery mode. What that means is you can reboot it and through the serial console on it, you can dump the existing config file off it. The idea of this mode is that you can change the password if you've forgotten it with physical access but we're relying on dumping the config off a device and it containing interesting information. Now it contains things like what VLANs are there. It will also contain hashes or possibly even encrypted versions of the passwords. So we managed to dump a config off one of the cabin control switches. It took about two or three minutes to get this, which isn't too bad. And they were hashed passwords. We put them on our cracking rig. It took, I think, about two days of effort to recover the password. Now the password wasn't bad, it was a reasonably good password. I mean, I know two days isn't too long, but it wasn't Cisco, it wasn't ship. Um, and we tried that against the, uh, the cabin switches, but none of them had a network log on. So you could plug into them via serial and connect, but that's not particularly bad. However, remember, we've got access to this trunk, which means we've got access to those RDPs. And what we found was one of the RDPs had left its management interface exposed to the trunks that we could access. And that RDP had left the web interface enabled. That username and password we recovered from one cabin switch worked on that single RDP. Now it turns out that during commissioning, that single RDP hadn't fully been commissioned. So they hadn't changed the password on it. We gained access to that RDP and that allowed us to intercept all of the traffic on that fiber trunk. So it wasn't just the things on the cabin switch loops anymore. It was pretty much everything on the vessel outside of the ICMS, the industrial control systems. So these VLAN trunks run all over the ship and you can connect from inside the cabin using the TV and phone cables. And it allows access to many, many systems, but it also allows sniffing to get any plain text auth. So not using HTTPS actually had impact here. The cabin switches had that brute forceable password and that password worked on just one part of the core network. That allowed us to intercept all of the VLAN trunks. So we've got a pretty significant compromise here. Now this was just an omission and it did take quite a lot of effort to get to this point, but it was a problem, a vulnerability. Issue four, I'm the captain now. Now, if you've been on a cruise recently, you'll probably notice that a lot of the crew will carry tablets. So when you muster, if there's a safety drill, they'll be taking muster on a tablet. If you order in one of the restaurants, it will be on a tablet. If they come to your room with room service, they will have a tablet. Um, and this is quite broadly called a passenger management system, a PMS. And it deals with lots of things. It does cabin assignment, it does access control. So quite often it will be linked into the access control system so that your card works on your cabin. It does restaurant booking and the billing in the restaurant. It does mustering and it also can hold your passport details for immigration. So it's kind of core to how the vessel operates. Now what we found was all of the tablets on this vessel used 8021X certificates for the Wi-Fi and the tablets were actually quite well hardened. We couldn't get anything off them easily so we couldn't get those certificates to gain access to the Wi-Fi. And we could have spent time doing something to, to possibly root one of the tablets or gain the creds from somewhere else. But remember, we've got access to every VLAN on the vessel, including the VLAN that carries the Wi-Fi traffic from all of the tablets. And we can intercept that traffic, which is what we did. So we found that the tablets, although they're using 8021X, that was actually implemented by the, the cruise company. They decided they wanted to layer that security on top. However, the PMS used HTTP. There was no encryption between the tablets and the server. That let us sniff credentials and other things going backwards and forwards. What we found, of course, was that there was a SQL server which was passing its username and password in the plane across this network. So once we gained access to those VLAN trunks, we could get this username and password. We could then add our own user into the passenger management system and we could pretty much do what we want. So I could book myself into the best restaurant on the ship and not have to pay for it, for example. 
But perhaps more fun was we actually worked out how to log in as the captain on this system. So we could go to the restaurant, we could order the most expensive bottle of wine and we could bill it to the captain. So this isn't good really, you know, this is a serious impact. The PMS had good Wi-Fi security that was put in place by the cruise company, but the PMS vendor used HTTP for the communications. It just wasn't secure enough. We've covered those common SQL creds. We've not managed to test them on any other ships. They could be the same across other ships. And with that, we could become anyone. We could wipe details. We could become, we could order things in restaurants. It's pretty crazy. So I think we pretty comprehensively owned this ship. It was a really, really good fun test. So what is the conclusion here? Well, these attacks did require detailed knowledge. We had to be on the vessel. We had to have a good level of understanding. We weren't really strictly detected. Um, one of the problems with a ship is it's hard to perform uh, things like intrusion detection remotely. So you might be able to sniff traffic and things like that, but you've only got a limited amount of bandwidth to send that back to a SOC. So no one really noticed us. Um, we dressed smartly, um, and the couple of times that, we, that people noticed us opening cabinets and things like that, no one said anything. Now, interestingly, most of the risks on this ship were actually introduced by third parties. The cruise company had done a lot to secure those networks, but it was third parties putting systems in and making mistakes and not doing security properly that introduced most risks. Now, for a ship, denial of service is very costly. If you can stop a cruise ship leaving its berth, especially in one of the smaller ports where there's only one or two berths and another ship's waiting to come in, the port can charge you huge sums of money. We're talking tens or even possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars per day. You've got passengers complaining. You're going to possibly have to reschedule flights, get hotels for people. Your next cruise may be delayed. So causing any denial of service, whether that's locking people out of their cabins or stopping the ship sailing, can cost you huge sums of money. So don't always think about it as steering another ship into another ship. Think about how you can impact the passengers. But lastly, cruise ships are massive amounts of fun. It's rare that you'd be able to explore such huge, complex machines with such level of detail. Um, definitely one of the most fun tests I've been on this one. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Cyber Gibbons on Twitter. If you've got any questions or you want to know anything more, just ping me a DM or, or send me a message on Twitter. That'd be great. Thanks for listening. Bye.